Okay, I think we can get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, before I start my presentation, I just wanted to say, feel free to type in in the chat or write down your questions in the q and I have um, the platforms page on my other monitor and I will be, I will be trying to monitor it um, during my presentation. Great. So uh, before I get started, I want to give you a little bit of introduction about myself and about my background. My name is Sarah Gaimi, and uh, I'm currently a technology specialist at TELUS in Canada. Today, I'm first going to talk a little bit about blockchain interoperability and give you some background on, the, on that whole thing. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the latest project that I've been doing on uh, this topic. The project is called a pops up architecture to promote blockchain interoperability. And it has been uh, a part of the Hyperledger mentorship program. I was a mentee in this program uh, last summer, and I had the opportunity to work with my amazing mentors, Sarah Rouhani, Raphael Belcher, and Professor Rui Cruz. Um, at the time, I was also a master's student at the University of Alberta studying software engineering and intelligence systems. And my uh, master supervisors, Dr. Hamza Khazai and Dr. Petr Musilek, were also part of this uh, project. So when we started the project, we had four main objectives in mind. We wanted to design a blockchain interoperability solution that can be used by hyperledger hyper technologies. Uh, we wanted to implement a proof of concept for the design, compare with other interoperability solutions, and analyze the performance. Uh, so before I tell you about the project, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about why blockchain interoperability is important and why we need it. So there are different aspects that we can think about this question. First of all, uh, there are a lot of blockchain networks being built around the world for specific use cases. And all of these blockchains are working independent from each other and they're isolated. This is limiting the opportunities that this technology has, and uh, we cannot really um, take advantage of all of these networks when they cannot work together. But other than that, different distributed ledger technologies have unique features. And I should clarify here that when I uh, talk about distributed ledger technologies, I'm talking about the underlying technology. Like, for example, Hyperledger Fabric is a DLT, and Hyperledger Indie is another one. But when we implement a network based on each of these technologies, then I'm going to refer to that as the blockchain network and not the blockchain technology. So when I say different distributed ledger technologies have unique features, um, I mean, for example, Hyperledger Indie is designed for digital identities specifically, but Hyperledger Fabric is a more general solution for uh, different permissioned use cases. So, since different technologies have unique features, if we can allow interoperability, we can actually uh, take advantage of these unique features of e different technologies instead of having to implement everything from the scratch every time. Also, uh, there are distributed applications that are, have already been built on different networks. And um, if we can allow interoperability, we can use the uh, the underlying and the technologies that they have, um, all of the features that they are providing as an application, we can use that in other applications as well, instead of implementing everything in each application separately. Uh, finally, we may need an asset from another network. So this one is separate from the previous ones. Um, for example, let's say I have a decentralized identifier or DID on a Hyperledger Indie network. And I want to use that asset in a Hyperledger Fabric network or any other network. So this is where I have a specific asset. And if we can allow interoperability, I may be able to use that specific asset on different networks. Uh, now, when we think about interoperability, um, there are different scenarios that come to mind. First of all, we may need to swap different assets across networks. Let's say, for example, I have some Bitcoin and my friend has some Ethereum, and we want to uh, swap these uh, between networks. So this is when we say uh, this is an asset swap. But then we may uh, want to migrate an asset from a network to another. Uh, for example, if if you if you have a decentralized identifier on one uh, Hyperledger in the instance, 
I may need to migrate that to another hyperledger in the instance. And that, that's when um, the second point um, is that basically asset migration from a network to another with the same technology. So I'm talking about two Hyperledger Indies, so they have the, uh, the same technology, but my asset is on one of them and I want to migrate it to the other one. This is the second point. And it's different from the third one, which is when I want to migrate the asset to another network with a different technology. Let's say, for example, I want to migrate that same asset to a Hyperledger Fabric network. So this, um, this has a little bit more um, challenges that we need to consider compared to the previous one. Another scenario is when we want to query data from another ledger. So let's say, for example, one blockchain has weather information on it, and I have this application that I want to use that weather information. So I can, all, I can just query that data from that blockchain. I don't really need to migrate the asset or swap any asset, but I just need to query some data from another ledger. And the last scenario that I have here is invoking another ledger. So let's say, for example, I want to sell some product and uh, there are two blockchains. One of them is responsible for the financial transactions. Let's call that the bank blockchain or the banking blockchain. And there's another blockchain that is responsible for delivering the product and it handles all, all the things on that part. Uh, when I sell something, I expect that uh, after the financial transaction is done on the banking uh, blockchain, that blockchain itself invokes and initiates a new uh, transaction on the delivery blockchain that we have. So this would be invoking from one ledger to another ledger. So now that we have some idea where a blockchain interoperability can be used and what scenarios there are, uh, we can talk about different categories of blockchain interoperability. One of the uh, most famous categorization is proposed by the World Economic Forum. If you scan the QR code on this page, you can download their white paper and uh, read about the details. Um, also, in the last few weeks, I think it was um, two or three weeks ago, I watched this talk that Dr. Luke Riley um, gave on this categorization, and he goes into the details. I really le recommend this talk if you're interested on this topic. You can uh, access it using the hyperledger.org website slash webinars. I'm just going to give you some overall information about this category because there's not much time to go into the details. So let's start with uh, cross-authentication. Uh, when we expect both of the um, parties, both of the interoperability parties, to crypt cryptographically authenticate the transactions, that's uh, when we fall under the cross-authentication. And there's no central trusted party in this category, and um, the, the blockchain networks work together directly. Then we have oracles, and oracle is an agent that enables the transfer of external data. This external data could be from another blockchain or could be from any other source on the internet. And here we need to trust that oracle, and that oracle could be either a centralized or a decentralized solution. Then we have API gateways. In this one, each distributed ledger network needs to implement their own connector. And as a result, um, these interoperability solutions can provide access to a lot of different uh, distributed ledger networks. And the reason is that each of the networks separately is implementing their own connector. Another categorization is proposed by my mentor, uh, Raphael Belcher. He also gave a talk a few days ago, I think two days ago, in uh, the Hyperledger Global Forum. And you can scan the QR code on this page to uh, download the research paper that he has written on this topic. So the first category here is the public connectors. Um, every interoperability solution that wants to connect two public uh, blockchains can fall under this one. Um, under this category, we have side chains. Here, the idea is to um, delegate the responsibility of the interoperability to the side chain and not handle it on the main chain. Then we have a hash lock time, co uh, time contracts. Here, the idea is that uh, we do cross-chain atomic operations using smart contracts. 
Then we have notary schemas. Here, uh, the notaries or the trusted parties help participants on one blockchain confirm transactions of another blockchain. The next category is the hybrid connectors. Um, here, every interoperability that wants to connect a private and a public blockchain together falls under this one. We have trusted relays here. Trusted uh, relays are trusted parties that redirect transactions from one blockchain to another. Then we have blockchain agnostic protocols. These solutions allow arbitrary distributed ledger technologies to interoperate by providing a blockchain abstraction layer. So you don't, you don't even know what the technology behind that is. You use this um, blockchain agnostic protocol to interact with it, no matter what the blockchain is. Then we have blockchain migrators. Here, the idea is to migrate a state of a blockchain to another. And finally, we have blockchain of blockchains. Um, here, this is a framework that provides reusable data, network, contract, or even consensus algorithm. And the blockchain that wants to be created uses these reusable parts and creates the blockchain from the scratch. And since different blockchain networks use the same pattern, they can easily interoperate with each other. So um, now I want to go into the details of our solution. Um, our idea was to use the publish subscribe architecture to enable interoperability. So here we have a broker blockchain that comes in the middle and um, it has two smart contracts. It has the connector and the topic smart contract. The connector smart contract is responsible for handling all the connections to different blockchains and the networking and everything. The topic smart contract holds the information about the assets that are being transferred or the information about that asset that is being transferred. Um, so imagine a source and a destination network that want to work together. We call the source network the publisher and the destination the subscriber. For each of these blockchains to be able to interact with our platform, they need to implement a connector smart contract. When they do that, they can use the connector to enroll in the system. And after the uh, enrollment is done, they can start interacting. The first step would be for the publisher to create a new topic. That would be step two in this uh, diagram. When they create a new topic, all the other blockchain networks can come in as subscribers and subscribe to that specific topic. Um, from that point on, every time the publisher updates the topic, uh, all of the subscribers will be notified of that change. And that topic, as I mentioned earlier, it could be just an information about an asset or when something about an asset changes, we can update the topic. Uh, it depends on the use case, but the main idea is that. So I mentioned we have two smart contracts, a connector and a topic smart contract on our broker blockchain. I want to tell you a little bit about different functionalities that they support. So here we have the init ledger function. Um, that's, that's a um, standard function that all the uh, smart contracts in Fabric have. And uh, that's basically the function that runs when you initiate the smart contract. Uh, then if you look at the connector smart contract, we have create blockchain. This function is used every time a new uh, blockchain wants to enroll in the network. And then we can use the unique ID of that blockchain to query information about it. And we can also query all the blockchains that are on the network. On the topic smart contract, the publisher can create a topic. And then the unique ID of the topic can be used to query information about that. You could also query all the topics that are on the network. And the subscribers can subscribe to the topic or some unsubscribe from the topic whenever they want. And uh, the publisher can publish to topic and the publisher uses this functionality every time they want to update information about it. So we implemented a proof of concept for our design to make sure that it's feasible and it makes sense. Um, all of our code are on the Hyperledger Labs GitHub page, and you can scan the QR code on this page to go to that link. We, imp we implemented the broker blockchain using Hyperledger Fabric version 2.2, and I will talk about why we used Fabric for this one. We used Hyperledger Caliper to analyze the performance and Hyperledger Explorer to monitor the performance of our network. 
And for the publisher and subscribers, we implemented these in different technologies and different versions of Fabric uh, because we wanted to show that this could eventually be used with other permission blockchains as well. So we implemented one publisher using Fabric version 2.2 and two subscribers using Fabric version 1.4 and another in Hyperledger Bezu. So why did we choose Fabric for the broker blockchain? Um, first of all, we, we were working on a, an interoperability solution for permissioned blockchains. So our broker needs to have the same level of access and the same level of control. So it had to be permissioned. Then also, um, the permission blockchains are usually used by the enterprises and um, Fabric is specifically designed for enterprises. So um, it was a good match for our solution. And Fabric supports smart contracts written in general purpose programming language, uh, languages, which makes it made it much easier for us to implement different smart contracts and different functionalities that we had. And Fabric is highly modular and configurable and that allowed us to um, change the configuration a little bit and try different things and come up with a better one. So here I have a demo for you um, to show you how this whole thing works. So here you can see the Hyperledger Explorer page uh, that shows you the transactions of the broker blockchain. And we have 11 blocks and 11 transactions uh, right now. Here you can see four windows. The top left one is the broker. The bottom left one is the publisher. And the two right windows are the subscribers. The top one is Fabric subscriber. The bottom one is the Bezu subscriber. So the first thing I want to do is to query all the topics on the network. I just want to make sure that there are no topics because I'm just starting the demo. And I want to do the same thing on publisher to make sure there are not uh, any topics there. Then I want to create a new topic from the publisher network. And um, I can I will give it a name, first topic, and a message, initial message. And I expect that this topic gets created on the publisher and on the broker. So I'm going to query again on the publisher. We can see that the topic has been created. And if you query the broker, we can see the topic has been created with a unique ID. And the list of subscribers is empty right now. So if I go to the uh, one of my subscribers, I first I first want to query that topic and make sure that it doesn't ex exist on my subscribers. So it doesn't exist, and then I can um, subscribe to that topic. And let's see what happens. So if we query the subscriber again, we can see that the topic has been created on this network. And if we query the broker again, we can see that blockchain zero, which is my fabric subscriber, has been added to the list of subscribers. And I want to do the exact same thing for my Bezu subscriber. First, I make sure that the topic does not exist on this network. And then I want to subscribe to that topic. And if I query again, I can see that the topic has been created and the formatting is a little bit different because this is Bezu and the other ones were Fabric. And if I query the broker again, I can see that blockchain one, which is my Bezu subscriber has been added to the list. So the next step is to update the message of my topic from the publisher. So I'm basically publishing to the topic again. So I update the message to new message and I wanna see what happens. I expect that all the other blockchain networks get notified of this change. So I first query the broker again. I can see that the message has been updated and it has new message. And if I query the subscribers, they all have the new message as well, which means um, the transaction was successful. So if you go back to the Hyperledger Explorer page, we can see here that the number of blocks and the number of transactions have been updated. So um, this is for the broker, so we're all done here. Okay, um, I mentioned earlier that we used Hyperledger Caliper to analyze the performance of our network. So these are the results. What we did was that we changed the uh, transaction send rate, which is shown on the top, we changed the send rate throughout time and we monitored the throughput and the average latency for, uh, for all the functionalities that our broker blockchain supports. Um, 
there are a lot of details here in this plot, but one thing that I want to mention is that the publish to topic functionality, which is the purple one, that's actually our bottleneck. We can see here that we couldn't even increase the stand rate um, as much as we did for the other functionalities. And um, the throughput gets, uh, gets uh, limited really fast and the average latency increases to up to 80, se 80 seconds even. Um, if you look at the subscribe, unsubscribe and create, um, they follow the, uh, the same pattern. The throughput is capped from, from some point on. And from that point, the average latency increases, which makes sense. Um, and for the query uh, function, we didn't really reach the limit in this experiment. So um, what are the next steps for this project? We can add support for other permission blockchains. Right now we support Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Bezu, and we have written sm uh, smart contracts for connecting these to our broker blockchain. But we can work on adding support for other permission blockchains as well. But um, any blockchain, as long as they implement a connector, they can connect it to this network. So it's not like we have to do anything on the broker side. It's mainly on the publisher and subscriber side. And then uh, we can add an access control layer. Um, right now, everyone can see and access all the topics on the network. We can add another layer of control. For example, publish the publisher network can control who can access the topics that they're publishing to. And we can work on enhancing the performance. So we already know the bottleneck of our network is the publish to topic functionality. So we can work on improving that and uh, making it a little bit more perf performant. And we can work on enhancing the transaction verification. Uh, right now, we're not doing um, much verification other than what Fabric does uh, in its default version. But we can add more verification steps to our platform. And finally, um, this solution can possibly be integrated with Hyperledger Cactus in the future. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing here. Uh, so, hello everyone. Hello, Brian. Hello, um, Tommaso. Um, Sandy, uh, I am not sure, like oracles and notaries that I talked about, they are in the categorizations that are proposed by the um, by Rafael Belchur and by the organization that I talked about. So these are not concepts that I'm proposing here. So they could come from Corda, but I'm not sure about that. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, we have some questions in the Q&A as well. Do we did all this? Um, so the question is, do you wait that all the subscribers commit uh, the operation to their blockchain? prior to removing the posted message. So we don't remove the message, actually. Um, the message is going to be there as long as the publisher wants it to be there. When the message on that topic is changed, we're going to replace it with a new one. So if the subscribers get the new version, so that could happen like the before they get the older version, a new version comes in. But they basically need the newer version, so they should be good. Assuming a subscribe to a topic, can a get the notifications uh, automatically? Yes, they will get the notifications automatically. So that that's the idea. Um, the A does not need to query anything. And that's the whole point of using the publish subscribe architecture. We don't want the subscribers to keep checking and keep querying the publisher to get the latest version. But the broker will let everyone know of the change. So uh, the question is, <clears throat> what would uh, be a typical use case? So there are a lot of use cases that um, you can think of. Um, 
I don't have a specific one, one in mind right now, but any blockchain network that wants to uh, query information of, uh, on an, from another network and wants to do something with that information, uh, they can use this platform because they don't need to keep querying it and every time it changes. Let's let's think about the weather example again. So for example, I want to um, have an application that does something based on the weather change. So um, by default, I have to keep checking the weather every time. I have to query it to see when it changes, how it changes. But in this platform, um, you can just subscribe to that and um, you can get notified every every time it changes. So the question is, could you talk a little bit about your roadmap for adding other blockchains? Are you mostly focused on those within the Hyperledger umbrella or looking at others as well? So um, our platform is open source and all of our code is open source. and um, we would appreciate anyone who's interested in adding um, adding different blockchains to our network. Uh, we're not limited to Hyperledger at all. Um, we are open to adding others as well. Uh, but we don't um, like. I don't have a roadmap right now to tell you. For example, in a few months we're going to achieve that or um, or the other. Uh, I don't have exact um, exact timings for that. But we are definitely open to adding other. Uh, permissioned blockchains as well. Okay, what MQ are you using for this or is that pluggable? Um, sorry, what do you mean by MQ, Sandy? Okay, um, Mohan, your question is, um, I mean, could a transaction occur on Fabric? and then a notification can tr trigger a payment in Bezu. Yes, this is totally up to the subscriber. So for example, if we have a publisher that is in Fabric, as it's written in Fabric, and um, we have a subscriber that is written in Bezu, um, something happens on the Fabric, the Bezu gets notified, it's up to the Bezu network what they want to do with that notification. So they can trigger a payment if they want. They can add it to their application to do something else. It's up to the subscriber. So um, right now, OK, so let me just read the question. Also, does data, uh, data flow bidirectionally uh, from Fabric to Bezu and back, or is Bezu currently only able to operate as a subscriber? So currently, uh, Fabric can be both a subscriber and a publisher, but Bezu, we currently only have um, subscriber uh, connector implemented for it. So the question is, how do you guarantee to the subscriber that the transaction went through the consensus protocol and is correct? That is a great question. And that's um, that's one of the points that I had uh, for, for the future work. Um, so basically right now we're just um, using the default verification of all of our platforms. That's definitely something that can be added to the network and it's of great value to have another layer of verification uh, about consensus. Uh, oh, okay, the message queue. So um, the PubSub is implemented as a smart contract in the Hyperledger uh, fabric network in the broker. So we have implemented the message queue basically. Great, I think I've covered all the questions um, and we're out of time. Um, thank you so much all for joining and feel free to contact me, reach out to me. Um, I'll be happy to have a discussion on this or anything else uh, related to blockchain. Um, oh, okay, let me just get this last question that I got in the Q&A. Um, how do we choose who acts as publisher node in a network. So the blockchains that want to participate, they choose whether they want to act as a publisher or a subscriber, it's up to them. 
so um, so Sandy, the presentation is up on the, on the website and you can go ahead and download it and all the links are there if you wanna go to the documentations on different things. Thanks again all for joining. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, I think I think we're all good.